Hari Om. We are going to talk about some common complications which may arise during pregnancy. Now actually pregnancy is a natural normal physiological process in a woman's life. It's an important milestone in a woman's life. But in certain cases, this pregnancy can become a bit complicated because of some health issues arising during pregnancy. So we will talk about some common complications during pregnancy. Also, we'll talk about the probable causes for these complications to arise and the effects of these complications on the health of the mother and also the health of the baby growing in the mother's womb. First and very common complication during pregnancy is hyperemesis gravidarum. Now the simple meaning of this word is excessive nausea or severe nausea and vomiting during pregnancy. Now it's quite common, many mothers they have nausea, vomiting during pregnancy, especially the first trimester of pregnancy, the first three months of pregnancy. But in some cases, this nausea and vomiting, it can be very severe and it can affect the health of the mother to such an extent that it becomes difficult for her to carry out her day-to-day -day activities. So here we are talking about a very severe form of nausea and vomiting, which will create health issues. Now the cause as such is not very well known for this hyperemesis gravidarum, but there are certain reasons which are mentioned. Most commonly, it occurs during the first pregnancy. The intensity of this hyperemesis, it will go on reducing with the consecutive pregnancy. So usually, it's not a rule, but then usually it is common in first pregnancies and they say that it is also common in unplanned pregnancies. When the pregnancy was not expected, when it was not planned, when it comes as a surprise, then in such cases there can be excessive nausea and vomiting. And as of course many conditions we say that there is a family history. So similarly here there would be a family history, there is a possibility of a family history like the woman's mother, she might also have had this hyperemesis gravidarum in her pregnancy. So usually we can say it's the first pregnancy which can be the reason it is also an unplanned pregnancy and of course with a family history. Now the most known reason for this hyperemesis gravidarum is excessive human chorionic gonadotropy hcg and in certain cases excessive progesterone secretion but most commonly it is the hcg so this is the hormone which is secreted the first hormone the levels of the hormone they increase during pregnancy usually this is the hormone which is excreted in the urine and then the urine pregnancy test is positive for pregnancy but then excessive levels of this HCG can cause nausea and vomiting. Also, it is said that it can be psychogenic. It 
can be psychological that the mother has heard that during pregnancy there can be nausea and vomiting and just because of that she might have excessive nausea and vomiting and in this case more than vomiting it is the nausea if it is a psychogenic cause for that Now, this excessive nausea vomiting is also quite common in those women who have a very low reserve of carbohydrate and glucose. So, less amount of storage in liver for this carbohydrate for glucose can be one of the reasons for this nausea vomiting. And then sometimes when there is no reason, you just say that it is some allergic reaction which is causing this hyperemesis in the diarrhea. Now, of course, usually the effects, they are glycogen depletion or less of glucose and carbohydrates. The reason is, one of the reasons is less reserve of carbohydrates and the effect would be further less carbohydrates in the body, which can further aggravate the problem. And less carbohydrate or carbohydrate starvation to be very specific because the mother can't eat properly. So as she cannot eat properly, her diet is not proper, it can lead to carbohydrate starvation. And of course, because of excessive vomiting, it can be dehydration. And this dehydration further can lead to an imbalance of the electrolytes, sodium, potassium and chlorides. So overall, the effect would be less water contained in the body, dehydration, imbalance of electrolytes, which can further lead to some other complications. And of course, carbohydrate starvation for the mother. And it can also have a bad, bad effect, adverse effect on the baby growing in the mother's womb because the mother can't eat properly. There is no proper energy supply. There is no proper nutritional supply. So the baby also might receive less amount of nutrition from the mother. Next, commonest complication is PIH, pregnancy-induced hypertension. Or in simple words, it is high blood pressure because of pregnancy or high blood pressure during pregnancy. So, pregnancy-induced hypertension, PIH, or high blood pressure during pregnancy is more or less of three types. The first type is preeclampsia or sometimes in simple words it is called as toxemia of pregnancy. The second type is eclampsia and the third type is gestational hypertension or in simple words high blood pressure during pregnancy. So quickly we will try to understand in short about all these three types. The first preeclampsia or toxemia of pregnancy. Now, this toxemia of pregnancy is a syndrome complex. And this syndrome complex, or in short, it is a combination of a few symptoms. When few symptoms come together, we will call it as a syndrome. And these symptoms in toxemia of pregnancy, there are three important symptoms together. The first is Hypertension, high blood pressure of more than or 140 by 90. Then there is edema or swelling. And the third symptom is proteinuria or presence of proteins in urine. So toxemia of pregnancy, three symptoms together is high blood pressure of 140 by 90 or maybe more than that. Edema or swelling and protein urea or presence of protein in the urine usually a healthy individual a healthy person would not have no protein in the urine so when these three symptoms they come together it is called as a syndrome and that syndrome is toxemia and usually this syndrome complex this toxemia of pregnancy eclampsia is seen after 
20 weeks of pregnancy. So it's not very early. After around 20 weeks of pregnancy, this toxemia may develop. Now, when you have to diagnose this toxemia, the blood pressure of the mother is to be measured at least on two occasions. So, minimum two times you have to measure the blood pressure, of course, on different days, but at the same time of the day. And when the blood pressure is 140 by 90 millimeters of mercury, or maybe more than that, it goes towards high blood pressure. Then there would be edema, usually over the ankles, and this edema would remain even after rest. And a simple lab investigation of urine will show presence of proteins in the urine. So the proportion is around 0.3 grams of protein would be there per liter of urine in around 24 hours. So when these three things come together, we will call it as toxemia. And of course, it's a complication. It's a, not a normal thing to have high blood pressure, protein in urine and swelling during pregnancy. And usually, it is more commonly seen in elderly pregnancies. Now, the definition of elderly pregnancies is different for many different regions, different countries. But then roughly you can say that the first pregnancy occurring after the age of around 35 years is usually considered as an elderly pregnancy. Post pregnancy after the age of 35 years. So that would be considered as elderly pregnancy and the chances of toxemia are a bit more in these elder pregnancies. And then of course neglect of antenatal, antenatal care like maybe no exercise or improper diet, improper lifestyle, not taking proper care of yourself during pregnancy, that can be one of the reasons of toxicity. Usually the symptoms which the mother would present is starting from headache. And this headache might be in the forehead or at the back side of the head, like occipital is the back side of the head or the frontal, the forehead, the headache can be there. But then this is a very vague symptom. There can be multiple reasons for headache. So it's not a diagnostic criteria for toxemia, but the mother can complain of headache. Then it would be disturbed sleep, but then again, there are many reasons for disturbed sleep. Interestingly, even before going to the lab for urine investigation, what the mother can complain is the urine output is less, the urine output is reduced. Even though she is drinking enough quantity of water, enough quantity of fluids, still the urine output in 24 hours has reduced less than maybe half a liter. So this thing should click to your mind and maybe the mother is suffering from toxemia that should come in your mind. There might be no signs and symptoms, but then the urine output would be decreased. And then another thing would be pain in the abdominal area, in the epigastric area is just below the chest bone. Epigastric area is just below the chest bone. So a very sharp pain in the abdomen, just below the chest bone and it is followed by vomiting. So these two symptoms like the urine output and the epigastric pain with vomiting, usually they indicate that the toxemia has started. 
otherwise headache and disturb sleep they don't have any specific significance and some cases they may complain of blurring of vision and abnormal weight gain but then again for this abnormal weight gain there can be multiple reasons and especially during pregnancy there can be many reasons for abnormal weight gain and then these can be the signs and symptoms of proxemia now the second type of pregnancy induced hypertension PIH first was the preeclampsia or the toxemia of pregnancy the second is eclampsia now mind you if the preeclampsia is not treated properly if the preeclampsia is not managed properly then it can turn itself it can convert itself into eclampsia which is a very severe condition as soon as preeclampsia is diagnosed toxemia is diagnosed measures are to be taken especially to control the high blood pressure and a proper management needs to be initiated for this preeclampsia if the preeclampsia is not managed properly it can lead to eclampsia which is actually complicated with convergence so pre eclampsia with convergence and maybe the mother may land up into coma is called as eclampsia and usually this eclampsia is in late pregnancy say around after 36 weeks or in 36 weeks after that the pre eclampsia which is not controlled which is not managed properly can get converted itself into eclampsia that is convergence and coma now this convergence and coma it can cause anoxia anoxia is less oxygen supply to the brain so basically because of convergence the mother's brain would receive less oxygen supply at the same time the baby can receive less oxygen supply it's a serious complication there can be swelling around the brain cerebral edema and the blood supply or the blood vessels supplying blood oxygen nourishment to the brain may go into spasm so all these things they will reduce the oxygen supply the nourishment of the brain it will be reduced so it's a serious condition but then of course it can be controlled by managing the preeclampsia properly so it is important to diagnose preeclampsia early and start the treatment manage it at early stages and if not managed in the late pregnancy it can land up into eclampsia convulsions and coma so as we said eclampsia is basically preeclampsia with convulsions so in simple language we can say that it is fits epileptic form fits so there is unconsciousness there is spasm of the muscles there is contraction and relaxation of the muscles it's all involuntary unknowingly it's happening and then there can be unconsciousness there can be confusion there can be coma and also in certain cases loss of memories loss of memory so it's tonic clonic contractions it is a spasm of the voluntary muscles there is no control over the muscular activity leading to fits leading to convulsions the effects of eclampsia would be mainly injuries injuries in the mother because its convulsions contraction and relaxation of the muscles epileptic form fits so it can lead to any kind of injuries in the mother there can be damage to the brain because of hemorrhages because of bleeding in the brain and the blood pressure acutely 
increases very severe kind of hypertension so this very severe kind of hypertension this cerebral hemorrhage it can cause damage to the brain and also sometimes the spasm of the arteries the spasm of the blood vessels supplying blood to the brain can cause anoxia less oxygen supply to the brain sometimes this eclampsia is also associated or during this convergence there can be vomiting and this vomiting as the mother is not very conscious about it the contents of the vomiting like they would be thrown out of the stomach but then once they come in the mouth they can get into the trachea from the trachea going into the lungs and causing infection of the lungs so this is a serious condition it's a very acute condition an emergency condition and a condition where the mother immediately needs to be hospitalized and taken proper care managed properly in the hospital the third type of pih pregnancy induced hypertension is the gestational hypertension or the simple hypertension during pregnancy high blood pressure during pregnancy now this high blood pressure during pregnancy is not complicated with swelling or edema and there is no protein in the urine so it is only hypertension only high blood pressure without edema and without protein urea so again usually it starts before the 20th week of pregnancy it is persistent it remains for a very long time so if the blood pressure is 140 by 90 mm of mercury or maybe more than that for more than 2 or 3 months then we will say it is the high blood pressure essential hypertension during pregnancy now usually there is no specific reason for that but then it can be in elderly women elderly pregnancies and usually quite often there is a family history of this essential hypertension during pregnancy or gestational hypertension now this hypertension it can be managed by lifestyle changes by changes in diet by relaxation techniques in some cases medication may be required but then it is important to try and maintain the blood pressure normal or at least see that the blood pressure is not increasing because if the blood pressure goes on increasing if it is not maintained in the normal range then this increase in blood pressure further can complicate into preeclampsia and then the preeclampsia can complicate into eclampsia so it is important to maintain normal blood pressure during pregnancy and as i said earlier simple changes in lifestyle can help to maintain the blood pressure normal the next and the most alarming symptom coming up during pregnancy can be hemorrhages bleeding in the early stages in the early weeks of pregnancy and one important reason for this bleeding in early pregnancy can be abortions or it can be sometimes ectopic pregnancies or the pregnancies which take place outside the uterus cavity they are called as ectopic pregnancy and other common reasons can be growths in the cervix or the vagina so this growth can be a mole it can be a polyp or any kind of other growth 
in the cervix or the vagina it can lead to bleeding in the early stages of pregnancy and the next reason can be erosion of the blood vessels in the cervical area or even the rupture of the veins the veins breaking up and leading to bleeding through the vagina so from abortion to maybe the erosion of the cervical area there can be multiple reasons for bleeding during pregnancy of course one of the most important reason abortion now the understanding of abortion the word abortion would be different in different countries all throughout the world ideally when the baby is not able to survive on its own and when the pregnancy is terminated it is called as abortion so it can be a natural abortion or it can be a medical abortion usually a natural abortion we call it as a miscarriage when the baby is unable to survive usually it is before 20 weeks of pregnancy are completed the baby is unable to survive on its own and if the weight of the baby is less than 500 grams it is considered that the baby would not survive so termination of pregnancy before that would be considered as abortion and it can happen naturally spontaneously leading to the hemorrhages the bleeding to vagina now the reasons for abortion can be multiple the most commonest reason for abortion is the congenital malformations of the fetus improper development of the baby improper development some of the organs of the baby maybe the heart is not developing properly maybe the nervous system is not developing properly maybe the kidney they are not developing properly so some important organ there is a defect in the development of that organ and then the nature decides that the baby would not be able to survive or the baby would not have a healthy life and then there is a natural abortion sometimes infections in the mother can be the cause of abortion severe infections in the mother and then these infections may be sometimes lead to hyperparesia or excessive increase in temperature fever in the mother can be the reason of abortion some health conditions of the mother like complications or diseases of the respiratory system or the heart in the mother can lead to less levels of oxygen in the mother's blood and it can have an adverse effect a bad effect on the baby which can lead to abortion so a bit complicated condition of the mother's health can lead to abortions excessive malnourishment leading to anemia very low levels of hemoglobin in the mother can be the cause of abortion and then of course some acute trauma it can be a mental trauma or it can be a physical trauma some emotional trauma or maybe a physical trauma like directly a blow on the abdominal area can be the reasons for abortion and of course this abortion leading to early hemorrhages during pregnancy now other other 
reasons for abortion can be some toxic agents entering into the mother's body or it can be tumors or fibroids which are growing in the uterus along with the baby so there is less space available for the baby to grow because the tumor is growing fast the fibroid is growing fast baby cannot grow properly leading to abortions or the cervix uh, cervix is not strong enough to hold the pregnancy to hold the weight of the baby so the cervix opens up prematurely leading to abortions as said earlier some infections or it can be even malnourishment deficiency of folic acid is the commonest reason so vitamin deficiencies folic acid deficiencies they can lead to abortion so any of these reasons can cause abortions in the mother the next complication during pregnancy is ectopic pregnancies and these pregnancies they do not continue but then ectopic pregnancies can land up into emergency situation and it's very important to save the mother's life so actually in short ectopic pregnancy are those pregnancies where the baby is not growing in the uterus cavity but it is growing somewhere else the baby is not growing in the mother's womb but it is growing somewhere else maybe the commonest site the commonest place, commonest place is the fallopian tubes so there is a typical history of short duration of amenorrhea like the mother has no menses and after that within a few weeks there is pain in the abdomen usually only on one side the left side or the right side and this pain is very severe it's very colicky kind of pain which is unbearable pain and of course with this pain there is bleeding through the vagina and because of the pain the mother may land up into shock and fainting and the blood pressure drops so the picture is very clear there is amenorrhea there is pain in the abdomen on one side either the right or the left and this pain is really unbearable pain there is vaginal bleeding and the blood pressure dropping down more or less definitely it's a case of ectopic pregnancy rupturing bursting open because the baby has no place no space to grow in the fallopian tube and actually the fallopian tube would rupture leading to all these symptoms and practically it is not possible for a baby to grow in the fallopian tubes the only place where the baby can grow and the pregnancy can be completed is in the cavity of the uterus the mother's womb causes of ectopic pregnancy why why the baby chooses why the fertilized ovum chooses to grow outside the uterus cavity why it chooses to grow to implant itself in the fallopian tubes the reasons are very interesting the first reason is inflammatory diseases inflammations chronic inflammations of the uterus and one of the reasons for chronic inflammation of the uterus can be the use of intrauterine contraceptive devices 
long duration use of intrauterine contraceptive devices is a known reason a known cause for ectopic pregnancies and along with that use of hormonal pills to prevent pregnancies these two they are the leading causes most important causes for ectopic pregnancy and then repeated abortions medical abortions especially repeated medical abortions so the first pregnancy the mother doesn't want that first pregnancy so she, she aborts herself second time she aborts herself third time third time she has an abortion multiple abortions continuous abortions and then the nature selects that the baby would grow in the fallopian tube which is practically not possible but then because of these repeated abortions the ovum is implanted in the fallopian tube so this ectopic pregnancy as i said earlier it cannot be completed it cannot be continued and at some point of course in early pregnancy itself there would be spontaneous abortion but then it's a medical emergency and it would be a question of life and death for the mother so here this is just for our understanding a sketch of the female reproductive system so as you can clearly see the uterus is a place where the implantation of the ovum can take place the fertilized ovum can take place and if the implantation takes place in the fallopian tube the left or the right fallopian tube practically there is no place there is no flexibility of that fallopian tube to expand and accommodate the growing baby so the ectopic pregnancy is the growth of the baby implanted ovum into the fallopian tube either the left side or the right side then we talk about hydromnios now hydromnios is excessive accumulation of fluid during pregnancy excessive accumulation accumulation of fluid in the uterus so the baby is growing in the uterus and around the baby there is fluid so if this fluid exceeds more than 2000 ml Two liters, then it is called as hydromnios. Too much quantity of amniotic fluid. Now, this too much quantity, as a, as we said, more than two liters, it will cause discomfort in the mother. This excessive fluid will create. further complications as such only this excessive amniotic fluid is not a troublesome thing but it may develop some complications this is just for our understanding that the abdomen the belly would look huge because of the excessive fluid in the uterus and as i said the complications of this hydromnios the first complication can be preeclampsia we already talked about what is preeclampsia so one of the reasons for preeclampsia can be hydromnios excessive amount of liquid excessive amount of fluid amniotic fluid in the uterus now as there is too much of fluid in the uterus the baby would not remain stable 
it is as if the baby is swimming in this excessive fluid doing somersaults in this fluid so there can be malpresentation of the baby at the time of childbirth malpresentation is like for example the head not coming out first maybe the baby has a breech presentation and then because of this excessive fluid it will cause excessive weight in the abdominal area and it can be one of the reasons for rupture of membranes and preterm labor or early labor so before the complete development of the baby just because of this excessive fluid in the uterus the labor pains can start and because of the weight of the fluid in the uterus the amniotic fluid the membranes they may rupture and they may initiate early labor and of course because of the excessive size of the uterus pushing on the diaphragm of the mother it can lead to palpitations and dyspnea in the mother there can be complications developed because of hydromnios but hydromnios in itself only hydromnios in itself may not be that troubles antipartum hemorrhage is another complication which may come up in pregnancy so the bleeding in the genital tract uh, through the cervix or through the vagina after the completion of 28 weeks and before the birth of baby is considered to be antipartum hemorrhage antipartum bleeding or bleeding before the child birth so it is after completion of 28 weeks of pregnancy but before the birth of the baby again the reason can be some growth like a polyp or a mole it can be even cancer carcinoma carcinoma tumor in the genital tract or it can be rupture of veins especially the varicose veins or it can be a local trauma a local injury but most importantly one reason is to be considered important and that is abnormalities of placenta because of some abnormalities in the placenta it can lead to bleeding in the genital tract and the most commonest abnormality of the placenta is placenta previa or in simple terms what is this placenta previa ideally the placenta is attached to the upper part of the uterus and then the baby is below that but if the placenta is attached to the uterus somewhere in the lower part of the uterus maybe completely covering the cervix or maybe even partially covering the cervical opening it is called as placenta so actually at the time of child birth at the time of labor first the baby comes out followed by the placenta which is a normal thing but then if the placenta is covering the cervical opening it is in the lower part of the uterus then the first the placenta has to detach itself and come out and then the baby can come out 
but then if the placenta is detached the blood supply the oxygen supply to the baby is stopped and it may create complication so placenta previa can be one of the reasons for hemorrhage after 28 weeks before the baby is born but at the same time it is life threatening to the baby this will give you an idea of the normal location of the placenta so as you can see it is somewhere in the upper part of the uterus and the baby is attached to the placenta with the umbilical cord so at the time of childbirth as i said earlier the baby would first come out of the cervix still attached to the umbilical cord to the placenta so it keeps receiving oxygen and nourishment from the mother and once the baby has come out of the uterus then the placenta will detach and will be removed out of you but in a condition where the placenta is placed in the lower part of the uterus as you can see in the second picture it's a condition called as placenta previa so during childbirth first the placenta will detach itself and would come out of the cervix and the moment the placenta is detached detached itself from the uterus the blood supply the oxygen supply the supply of nourishment to the baby will stop before even before the baby comes out of the uterus even before the baby is born so it would be life threatening and nowadays in modern science the only solution for this which the doctors would prefer is a cervical section c section so that the baby is taken out of the uterus first and then the placenta is removed another condition of the placenta can be abruptio placenta so basically the placenta may be placed normally the placenta is attached to the uterus at a normal place in the upper part of the uterus but then because of some reasons there can be premature separation of the normal placenta the placenta will detach itself from the uterus prematurely early but then this detachment it can be partial or very nominal and in these conditions there would be minor bleeding which may not be seen coming out of the vagina or sometimes the mother may just complain of some dark colored bleeding not a fresh blood but a dark black colored blood coming out of the vagina with an abdominal discomfort so abdominal discomfort slight pain in the abdomen or even it may not be pain it would be just discomfort followed by dark colored blood coming out through the vagina is an indication of abruptio placenta of course the pregnancy can be continued with some precautions with total rest but then it's always a threat to the mother's life and even the baby the reasons for abruptio placenta can be abrupt increase in pressure over the uterus 
may be because of some excessive bending, excessive exercise. Or it can be a direct trauma, physical trauma to the abdomen, leading to slight separation of the normally placed plasma. Or it can be even high blood pressure. Excessive high blood pressure can also be the reason of abruptio placenta. And then because of this, there can be bleeding through the vagina. We stop here. Are you?